So we're here to celebrate the publication of Solma Sharif's debut poetry collection, Look, published by Grey Wolf. Um, we're joined by an all-star lineup. We've got Solmaz, of course, alongside Kathy Park Hong, Mariam Ghani, and Ricky Laurentis. This is gonna be a really special night, so um, sit back and soak it all in. It's worth mentioning right off the bat that Solmaz has a very special relationship with the workshop. She was the managing director here for many years ago, and so to us, this feels, you know, even, even for those of us who never really worked alongside her um, or overlapped with her here, it feels like a kind of homecoming. Um, we've asked Ricky, Mariam, and Kathy to start the night off. I'll introduce each of them. They'll be reading some of their own work, sharing, uh, and then we've asked them to choose something from Solmaz's collection, Look, to read as well. I'll then come back on stage, introduce Solmaz, and um, we'll open it up to some questions at the end. So first up, we're gonna hear from Ricky Laurentis. Ricky is the author of Boy with Thorn, recipient of the 2014 Cave Canem Poetry Prize. His debut collection was named one of the top poetry books of 2015 by BuzzFeed, Poets and Writers Magazine, Lit Hub, Split the Rock, The Advocate, and The Poetry Foundation. Kathy Park Hong describes Ricky's collection with these words, quote, from slaves to queer lives ravaged by hate to those disenfranchised by Katrina, Laurentis unflinchingly looks at the brutal lineage of a black body made into a spectacle in pain while also questioning this looking, this singing. Um, in response to a question that I asked Ricky about cues and exercises or rituals that uh, gets him into his practice, he wrote back saying the following. Sometimes a word gets in my head and sticks and I follow it. More often an idea does or some half of an argument. I follow that too, although it's much harder to track. Harder because I'm not sure where we're taught in poetry to do this. The essayist is, but not the poet. The poet, she must follow the sound or the image and have fun and delight. She shouldn't be trying to make or impress an argument. Don't be political. But for me, we only have so much time on this planet, really. For some of us, because of political or social or national agendas, even shorter. If I'm reading a poem, I want to be taught how to live and how we can live better. I want to be reminded how precious life is, really, sadly. I'd like to welcome to the stage, Ricky. apologize I'm feeling a little dehydrated so my voice may be softer than usual pretty soft-spoken but hopefully we'll make it through um, I'm very excited to be here um, to celebrate a book and a person that literally not sort of superficially or dramatically but literally changed my life and helped me in the pathways to critiquing myself, critiquing my complicity with certain social systems, and also just help me be a better person. So thank you, Samaz, for everything that you've done and teaching me to look at myself. No pun intended with that. Um, so um, as was said, we were asked to read some poems from Samaz, as well as our own work. And we were also kind of told to read work that, I, know, I forget the prompt, but sort of reflected this idea of words on terror or of a state language, state militia. So I don't know if I succeeded, but this is my attempt. I thought I would interweave them. So we're going to start off with a poem, one of my favorite poems by Samaz, which is called Vulnerability Study. <laughs> yes, I love it. <laughs> I love it already. Vulnerability Study. Your face turning from mine keep from coming. Eight strawberries in a wet blue bowl. Baba holding his pants up at the checkpoint. A newlywed securing her updo with grenade pins. A wall cleared of nails 
for the ghost to walk through. Beautiful bottom, beautiful shame. The way he writhed beneath the other man argued his loneliness. But he wasn't just a blank measure waiting to sound. However much an O his mouth made, he wasn't just an O thrusting back up against what is almost like a finger, though it isn't, always needing to be touched like a finger to be held. I'm lonely. My waist cinched inward like some vintage Japanese fan, the clever blade of my back working inch by inch toward a pleasure half mine, the way fire pleases, wax pleases. What does possession mean? No, really, tell me. That at this moment, someone beside myself can feel how many times I shudder. Asked if I like it. I like it. I speak out those three syllables, mess myself. The point is, I think, to empty. It feels good. To be two men interlocked in a sentence still forming. We dance the dance that says, I want you. Come closer, come in me. No, really, he said as a whisper, boy, you want to be possessed. Because you see, he had been removed from his body then, per usual. His beauty, like a talisman offered, his woundedness revealed. For the Latin geeks in here, the root word of vulnerability is wound. That's a really interesting thing. I feel the fault line that runs through Palestine to Ferguson. It's one that's been running beneath us a long time through several borders across many ages, linking one injustice to another, one set of historical violences to its cousins. Though it's important to note that to link injustices isn't necessarily, importantly, to conflate or equate them. I can recognize, for instance, the logic that leads to a Palestinian child being killed unsentimentally as by a drone attack, a lynching, as linked to the logic that would also have a policeman's bullet entered a black American child's head, a lynching, without ever once having to claim that the cries both children made, that their mothers made, were the same. They are not the same. They carry different weights, different colors, but have some kinship, I think. When I say logic, I guess I mean all those discourses that would have these events make sense even as they are senseless, and therefore continue to propel these events outside the arena of the imagination and into bald reality. The imagination, that's what I'm always thinking about. How is it that, how it is that thing both uniquely, paradoxically responsible for the ways we can bring harm to each other and all the other ways we might love and heal? This next poem begins with the epigraph, which is the memory of your image of Mike Brown on the ground, dead for four hours. Continuance. Whoever here, Mr. Dark, tricking me, steaming from a manhole in Missouri, or else you're damp between the motions of the trees, revealing the breezy discourse of those trees' black sound. I can see now how everything I've learned of you is wrong. How an air of dumb assumption lounged on my brow, a liar, winking, claiming a shadow is as empty as my childhood vision of the falling sun meant emptiness. But every child knows what moves the wind at night, knows what leads some birds to develop their unrest in the high green of some trees or lower, what leans against that tree's bark, a man or is it the just barely intelligible idea of one, head back, maybe eyes closed, moaning, working to hysteria, the erection rising like a haunted chain away from him? If I move closer, carrying a glass cup, if my mouth is that cup, though I've known fear move as bravely in this world, moved like a physical man, it could shoot a boy. So shoot me. Who said that? Was it really the black of my tongue? But how could any breed of blackness ever wish to be penetrated? I could tell you how a foot creaks even falling dead in the night, 
the tail, the red, a mother cries when she feels that absence drop like pity inside her. But I cannot say what a bullet says as it enters a child's skin. But come in. You can enter me, Mr. Dark. Let tonight be the first night I deeper see the pregnant possibilities of your design. How your fingers move to build such antique attitudes, turning a moaning of the wind into a man, making what is a tease of grass the hill into terror, now pleasure, then back to grass again. Aren't you the mirror in which all lights balance? Aren't you the line on which all lines cross? Anything lives in you so that the dark over there can be the dark of Mike Brown, full of breath, that the dark right here can be the dark of my own bastard mind, that this dark come closest to my lips is a shadow's knowledge, full, not ever empty, charitable as it is wicked, risky as it is good, fascination, perversion, and I move to it, to you, a shadow chaser, hearing the birds make restlessness in the trees, watching the man stroke velvet from his body, head still back, maybe eyes parted, he's singing now. He's at that point when I must surrender my knees to gravity and mouth ready, be gone. I'll choose what ground I lie on. Back to some laws. <laughs> with a wonderful poem called Look. It matters what you call a thing. Exquisite, a lover called me. Exquisite. Whereas, well, if I were from your culture living in this country, said the man outside the 2004, 2004 Republican National Convention, I would put up with that for this country. I could say 2016, yeah. probably, right? <laughs> um, it's not my poem, but. Whereas, I feel the need to clarify, you would put up with torture, you mean? And he proclaimed, yes. Whereas, what is your life? Whereas, years after they look down from the jets and declare my mother's Avedon block probably destroyed, we walk by the villas, the faces of buildings torn off into dioramas, and recorded on a handheld camcorder, and said, that's a gun, as I trained the lens on a rusting gun-type weapon, and that's a rack, as I zoomed over the river. Whereas it could take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger pulled in Las Vegas, Las Vegas and the Hellfire missile landing in Mazar al Sharif, after which they will ask, Did we hit a child? No, a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas the federal judge at the sentencing hearing said, I want to make sure I pronounce the defendant's name correctly. Whereas this lover would pronounce my name and call me exquisite and lay the floor lamp across the floor so that we would not see each other by direct illumination, softening even the light. Whereas the lover made my heat rise, rise so that if heat, were sensor, heat sensors were trained on me, they could read my thermal shadow through the roof and through the wardrobe. Whereas you know we ran into like groups like mass executions with hands tied behind their backs and everybody shot in the head side by side. It's not like seeing a dead body walking to the grocery store here. It's not like that. It's a rack, you know. It's a rack. It's kind of like acceptable to see that thing here and not. It was kind of like seeing a dead dog or a dead cat laying. Whereas I thought if he would look at my exquisite face or my father's, he would reconsider. Whereas you mean I should be sent missing because of my family name? And he answered, yes, that's exactly what I mean adding that his wife helped draft the Patriot Act. Whereas the federal judge wanted to be sure he was pronouncing the defendant's names correctly and said he had read all the exhibits, which included the letter I wrote to cast the defendant in a loving light. Whereas today we celebrate things like his transfer to a detention center closer to home. Whereas his son has moved across the country. Whereas I made nothing happen. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a thermal shadow. It appears so little and then vanishes from the screen. Whereas I cannot control my own heat, and it can take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger, the hellfire missile, and a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas a dog, they will say, now, therefore, let it matter what you call a thing. Let it be the exquisite face for at least 16 seconds. Let me look at you. Let me look at you in a light that takes years to get here. Okay. I have one more poem, and then we have the rest of the readers. 
And it is, I'm so glad that, I'm so modest, we never talked about this, but like your book opens with your title poem and my book ends with my title poem. And I feel like we have some kinship there, some sort of, <laughs> some sort of book endedness happening in that world. But I'm gonna conclude with the title poem, which is Boar with Thorn. And thank you for listening. Boar with Thorn, first century BC, bronze. One, entered those shadows spoke his loneliness like a god. Two, this was new knowledge, the kind he had little business knowing, the mere risk of it making it all the more delicious. Three, a forced out confession of forcing it in. Four, each push where the blood yawned like an opiate, each inch a hermeneutics of the self. Five, would you feed on such hurting? Would you drink so much? Six, was he so terrible a thing to look at? What was looked at? Seven, his face just a deliberate, his face a question gone and answered. Eight, there could have been a thorn already inside, his tongue scratching its wrong, speaking its six troubles. Nine, how, ten, there could have been a thorn already inside, the point in his eye, what makes the shadows their acutest when they lift and sprawl. Eleven, I keep thinking of the thorn as a marker, scrawler, which shapes the places both excused and forbidden in his body's swamp. Twelve, violence thou shalt steal, violence thou shalt want and store inside. Thirteen, this binario, Fidele, boy with a message, a mission, piccaninny, who would not stop for damage, the old story goes. Fourteen, shame, guilt, spleen, woe, shock, and want. Fifteen, he wanted them gone. I know all his deeper hurts, poorer gods, that lush resentment. Sixteen, but failed. They were greater dark, vows and mystery, done things. Seventeen, take it. Don't you have to learn to take it eventually? 18, I told him the thorn was as a key, his body a lock. 19, I made him meet the key up with the lock. Turn 20, I told him Ricky. Turn 21, he did. An antichrysalis, a lyric, which is the piece of a prayer visible. 22, until he rewound. A new republic, a kingdom where not savagely he was king. 23, who could bear the wind? 24, who could feel the self demanding the self? 25, who could see his honesty? His face more handsome once the pain combed through. Combed like a river too clean for love. 26, violence thou shalt want, violence thou shalt steal and store inside. 27, he would devour it. 28, this was his body, his body finally his. 29, he shut the thorn up in his foot and told his foot, walk. Thank you, Ricky, that was, that was incredible. Next up, we're gonna be hearing from Mariam Ghani. Mariam is a visual artist, writer, filmmaker, and teacher whose practice is based on research into places, spaces, and moments where social, political, and cultural structures take on visible and tangible forms. Since 2004, she's collaborated with the artist Chitra Ganesh to produce Index of the Disappeared an experimental archive of post-9-11 detentions, deportations, renditions, and redactions. She recently curated the international symposium, Radical Archives. Her exhibitions and screenings include the Rotterdam, the Sharjah and Liverpool Biennales, or Biennales, uh, Documenta in Kabul and Kassel, MoMA in New York, the National Gallery in DC, the St. Louis Art Museum, and the CCCB in Barcelona. In her artist statement, she lists her recurring preoccupations. Border zones, no man's lands, translations, transitions, the slippages where cultures intersect, security cultures, archives, architectures of democracy and national imaginaries, places where nature and artifice imitate and influence each other, and the intersections of war, trauma, memory, identity, migration, language, and loss. Um, please join me in welcoming Mariam to the stage. Okay. So, like Salmaz, um, I've been obsessed for quite a long time in collecting the language uh, of the war on terror. Uh, and uh, that's a large part of what we do in Index of the Disappeared. It's kind of probing uh, the, the records for these really odd moments, you know, where official language kind of breaks into something else. So um, 
That's uh, part of what I'll read for you tonight. I'm going to start with Somaz's poem, Dear Intelligence Journal. Lovely dinner party, darling casualties, and lean sirloin damage of the collateral sort extended my letter of offer and acceptance to the desired internal audience, reaching desired effect and desired perception, a lengthy and essential planning phase down to our party's seating chart where I perfectly placed gentlemen to avoid a hostile environment, showed great constraint, civil affairs, a real civil censorship. Even when he dropped that megaton weapon on me, coyly I promised, wait until you taste the coup de main. He stayed. To think nights ago I wished disengagement. Following tonight, to the tea, I did as mother suggested. Identification, friend or foe. Turned out, friend. If you have found this, please stop reading now. We were friendly beneath the gazebo's lattice, a low visibility operation, which is what my over-the-horizon radar was telling me. The interpretability of, well, initial assessment, really, just marginal information. I know, I promise more later, but still a truly, really important point of no return. Stepped out to assess this area of influence, to admire together the architecture, share a desired appreciation of our homeland that, fingers crossed, we will build together. Okay, bear with me for one second. And I'm going to read you something from Notes on the Disappeared, 2004 to 2014. One, a case of mistaken identity. Wrong place, wrong time, wrong name, wrong face. That grove of pomegranate trees, not an orchard after all, but a reliquary. Two, extraordinary renditions for ordinary men. Your only protection, what you carried in your pockets on the day you disappeared. A white coin for the black day, a blue bead for the evil eye. Three, traps built by the language of law for all with foreign tongues. Your name held against you like a loaded gun. Four, men without countries, canaries in mind. The walls of indefinite detention bricked in around them for good luck. Five, a letter so secret, once read its existence, could never be spoken of again. The trick, recognizing the envelope. Six, this is no time for compromise. We are all presumed threats until proven otherwise. Seven, cloaked and daggered, they scour the streets to conjure up an enemy. Eight, they knock on the door in the dead of the night. When they don't knock at all, you're more likely to die. We have all become children, afraid of the dark. Nine, the second time was her first mistake. Torturers are not born, but made. Ten, a declination scrawled on a fax permits a man to be burned into powder and ash. Eleven, he lost the day, the night, the week, the month, and then the year. The first days were notches on a wall, and then day was dark, and dark was light, and nothing counted but fear. Twelve, the rope is burning, but a twist remains. My mouth tight shut, tries to shape your name. Thirteen, I asked for a witness, a translator, a list of the charges, and a clean sheet of paper. They gave me the paper, but of course I had forgotten to also ask for a pen. Fourteen, you should always read the writing on the wall. In this case, a sign saying, no blood, no foul. Fifteen, between the tiger and the precipice, most acts leave no evidence. Occasionally, though, a body turns up. Sixteen, a rose can bloom in the mist of mud, but blood cannot be washed out with blood. Seventeen, dying unnamed, unclaimed, unnoticed. It is later than you think, and your history has already been written in invisible ink. Eighteen, seizing the haystack to find the needle, and burning the haystack to find that the needle was never even there. Nineteen, now we know all that we thought we should know, we find we know nothing we needed to know. Twenty. <coughs> Every eye has its look, and every deed done has its end. 21. Measure the erasure that meets our descent. We must not forget that compliance is consent. 22. Your silence will not protect you when the border moves. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And now I'm going to read a little bit from Personal Effects. This begins with an epigraph from Susan Sontag saying, like guns and cars, cameras are fantasy machines whose use is addictive. 
I place a photograph of my uncle on my computer desktop, which means I learn to ignore it. He stands by a tank, helmet tilting to his right, bootlaces tightened as if stitching together a wound. Alive, the hand brings up a cigarette we won't see him taste. Last night I smoked one on the steps outside my barn apartment, a promise I broke myself. He promised himself he wouldn't and did. I smell my fingers and I'm smelling his. Hands of smoke and gunpowder. Hands that promised they wouldn't, but did. This album is a stop loss. By a dim lantern or in the latrine, he flips through it. He looks at himself, looking nearly as he does, closest to himself then as he could be, just learning how to lean into his new body. He suspends there by standing order, a spreading fire in his chest, his groin. He's on stage for us to see him. See him? He stands in the noontime sun. A young soldier pictured above, the son of an imam, brother to six, is among the latest casualties in the military campaign of Susengard. Your whole body in a photo, your whole body sitting on a crate, pressing your eye socket to the viewfinder of a bazooka, crouched as you balance, the metal tube on your shoulder, in one you guide a belt of ammo into the unfiring weapon, proud, your elbow out as if mid-waltz, your frame strong and lightly supporting the gun, a kind of smile ruining the picture. You're posing, you're scared. A body falls and you learn to step over a loosened head. You begin to appreciate the heft of your boot soles, how they propel you, how they can kick in a face, the collapse of a canopy bed in an aerial bombardment, mosquito netting doused in napalm, cheekbones fragile as moth wings beneath the heel. You tighten your laces until they hold together a capable man. Whatever reigns, the weight of your feet swings you forward, goose-stepping pendulums, a body less and less yours. A body, God knows, is not what makes you anyway. So the hands that said they never would begin finding grenade pins around their fingers, begin flipping through this album with soot under their nails. You were not ready, but they issued the shovel and the rifle and you dug, but to watch you sitting there between the sandbags, but to watch the sand spilling out the bullet holes, but what did they expect? But what did they really think a sheet of metal could prevent? But I sat rolling little ears of pasta off my thumb like helmets, but it was not a table of fallen men, but my hand registered fatigue, but the men in fatigues were tired of sleeping in shifts. But you snuck into town and dialed home until you wrote your fingers were tired. But the code for Shiraz was down, but all of Shiraz was down. But the sheet lightning above the Ferris wheel of rusted bolts. But I am sure they are all right, you wrote, well to reassure yourself. But the wind like an old mouth shaking the unnamed evergreen outside my window. But what I mean is I'd like very much to talk a bit. Hello. Okay, I'll just write you a little sketch I wrote from Kabul in October 2011. You are a raw nerve. You can be plucked like any zither string or other things stretched beyond resistance. When you are plucked, you play a threnody. You keen and cry privately. You are tensed as if for flight. Your bones bird brittle, your flesh whittled away for speed. You balance on the knife edge of an abyss. Your hollow eyes address the pit. You look at it as if a black hole could be a mirror, a lover, a comforter to shield you from the harsh light of the dawn. And one last little one. Uh, who was the poet that, who said that life is nasty, brutish, and short? Lately events conspire to confirm his particularly mordant perspective. All around people are dying too young or at least with too much left to do. On every side, people are sick or subjected to casual brutalities. At any moment, the window might implode from the force of a nearby bomb or passing storm. The source of the force depends only on the context. But does it even matter why we are now crawling over broken glass to get from bed to bath? The icy draft from the broken door is cold regardless. We are all the same in our disasters. Eurictus of pain is as old as its story and as recognizable. I've seen it on a thousand faces, in clay and paint and half-tone print, in the mirror and reflected back from every sort of screen. I too would like to ululate, but no one ever taught me how, and so I must perform my grief in private, or on paper, or by proxy, not out loud. Thank you, Miriam. 
Kathy Park Hong has been a very close friend to the Asian American Writers Workshop for years, and we are very happy to have her joining tonight to celebrate Solmaz's debut. She was an early recipient of the Asian American Writers Workshop's Van Leer Fellowship. Um, Kathy is the author of Engine Empire, a poetic guide through the fictionalized boom towns of the Californian Old West, present day industrialized China, and the digital future. Her earlier collection, Dance Dance Revolution, was chosen by Adrian Rich for the Barnard Women Poets Prize. Kathy has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and the New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship. She is the poetry editor of The New Republic and is an associate professor at Sarah Lawrence College. In an interview um, for Bomb Magazine, Kathy, in response to a question about um, a poet's engagement with politics, said the following. Inevitably, as more channels or more portals to information are opened, the more we become swallowed by the arena of commerce and lose our intimacy with the human encounter. We lose clarity, and most of all, our empathy. Poetry offers the possibilities of clearing those obstructed passageways and reviving our attention to what matters. The poet is a tenant of culture. You're engaged with politics even when you claim that you aren't, even if you're writing ekphrastic poems about Flemish paintings. <laughs> That's always a choice. Please join me in welcoming Kathy Farkong to the stage. So, can you hear me? All right, let's get the right mic. Here. All right, so I'm excited to, um, I'm really happy to help celebrate Solmaz. Um, Solmaz's look, which is brilliant. Um, actually, I uh, was introduced to Solmaz's poetry very early on. Um, I think it was in like 2009 or something crazy like that. It was uh, Ken actually emailed me her poems to me, uh, it was when I was an editor for Jublot, and her poems just blew me away. And I've uh, read different iterations of it, and I'm just so happy that it's out in the world, and I just think that, um, you know, I think uh, this summer has been an exceptionally violent summer. Um, there's, you know, in certain sense, we're uh, living in terrifying times, but I feel like we're always living in terrifying times. But at the same time, I've, um, there's been this real renaissance of political poetry that's on the vanguard uh, thematically and formally, and Solmaz's look is so integral, integral to that movement. So um, I'm gonna read, um, it's, I'm gonna just read little bits of an essay that I'm still working on. It's, hopefully it'll make sense to you, because I'm just going to skip around. But I thought it would introduce Solmaz's poetry, because um, it has to do with language as an instrument of power. And I forgot to answer the question, what are some of your prompts? I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think this will answer your question, actually. It's called Becoming English. One. My mother rooted through the dryer and extracted a large red t-shirt with the white silhouette of a bunny. It must have been a gift for my father. My immigrant mother didn't recognize the logo, and the next day she dressed me in that Playboy t-shirt and sent me off at, at the age of eight to school. Only one kid came up to me when I was waiting in line after, re after recess to return to our class, a fifth grader pointed to the front of my shirt and asked me if I knew what that meant. When I said no, and I saw her smirk and turn away, I knew yet again that something was wrong, but I didn't know what was wrong. Blood rushed to the tendrilled veins of my face. It is this shirt, but why? Unlike uh, Shakespeare's Shylock, where upon his brow 
Shame is too ashamed to sit. Shame loves to stagger in and sit on my face. Sartre said that shame is when, quote, I recognize that I am as the other sees me. Even if not much happened the night at that party, it feels like I were at that party drunk and passed out, and my new friends decided to have fun at my expense and graffitied my unconscious face with permanent marker. Then I grope awake, look at the mirror, and there it is, my face, a bathroom wall of scribbled dicks. Language feels intrinsic to you when learning it predates memory. We don't actually remember how we used to echo after our mothers or sing back nursery songs. But when you first encounter the language in the classroom and you are made to feel dumb for not knowing it, then the painful process of learning it, the drills, the recitation, the copying, is burned into your memory like a welt. Writers from immigrant or low-income families will often mention the lack of books in their childhood homes. For instance, the only books my family owned for a while was an old hand-me-down encyclopedia set. My favorite book was Encyclopedia Volume D for its pictures of dogs and deer. <clears throat> Others might mention a Bible or a stack of TV guides. This literary deprivation once a source of shame, becomes a badge of pride. The writer is implicitly saying, look how far I've come, giving the public hope that, no matter your class or racial background, talent can flourish anywhere. I forgot about the Playboy t-shirt until years later, when I was browsing English.com, a site that uploads photos of East Asian signs that comically botch up English phrases, like caution, butt head against wall, or photos of Asians wearing t-shirts like, quote, I feel a happiness when I eat him. Syntax totters precariously until it collapses into vulgarity. Construction's work are taking place in this area. Please excuse for the molest. The most viewed photo is an ad featuring a cute illustration of a bubble tea with the caption, I'm bubble tea, suck my balls. <laughs> I was scrolling through the site to see if I could find inspiration for my poetry when I came across a photo of a little Chinese boy wearing a t-shirt with a North Face logo, except the logo was doctored into sex face. He is smiling shyly at the camera, completely unaware of the profanity of his shirt, and that a stranger is taking his photo precisely because he is unaware of the profanity of his shirt, and that he will then be uploaded onto an American website where he will be viewed, shared, and commented on thousands of times because he is unaware of the profanity of his shirt. When I saw his photo, I flashed back to that day, but I remembered it as if I were looking at myself on English.com, a little round-faced Korean girl in long braids with her right hand over her Playboy shirt, pledging allegiance to the flag. I was a predecessor to an internet subgenre. You might be wondering why I was on English.com for poetry. I have an interest in English's failures. I have an interest in unmastering English and then remastering it. I am of the school that anything can be a poem, like for instance, a grocery store list. I myself collect English platitudes because they could be a line in a poem. Take the phrase, I feel a happiness when I eat him. It has all the traits of a surprising poetic line. A familiar, a familiar sentiment has now become unfamiliar because chance has turned error into eros. Even that indefinite article A is a hiccup that tweaks a tone into a pleasing animatronic pitch. With the right grammatical transgressions, anything can become poetry. This, by the way, is not another tired postmodern exercise. Bad English is my heritage. The closest lineage I have 
are writers who make the unmastering of English their rallying cry, who deterritorialize it, queer it, twerk it, hack it, calibanize it, other it into another language. Over time, there has been an efflorescence of verbs that describes what Deleuze calls the minoritization of language, or in other words, the hijacking of standard English and warping it to a fugitive tongue. So from there, I'm going to go into Selmus' poetry. <coughs> this is a, um, I'm just going to read an excerpt called re re uh, Reaching Guantanamo. And these are letters to someone in Guantanamo. <clears throat> and they're redacted. Dear Salim, love, are you well? Do they, you? I worry so much. Lately my hair, even my skin. The doctors tell me it's I believe them, it shouldn't, please don't worry. In the yard and moths have gotten to your mother's. Remember, I have enclosed some, made this batch just for you. Please eat well, why did you me to remarry? I told, and he couldn't, it, I would never. Love, I'm singing that you loved. Remember the line that went? I'm holding the just for you, yours. Dear Celine, lightning across the sky all night, lighting up my, but no rain, no. When I get home, everything is dust, one pair of, by the, one towel, one, one, in the morning. Anyway, I couldn't, so I sat by the window watching its streak, and thinking I must look like something lit up and like this, yours. Dear Salim, at the store they brought, already bruised on the, but still juicy, I pitted sour, all day the newspaper went with their juice. I save you, jars of preserves for your return. Some plums, too. I haven't opened it since they, you, can't stand in all those, all those teeth, or maybe the, how they stay in upholstery like I hope I don't make you me. I hope they allow you some yours. Thank you. So although um, Ken Chen, our executive director, couldn't be here tonight, um, he emailed me some remarks for an introduction um, to read out loud. So what I'm about to read um, is, is from Ken. The Asian American Writers' Workshop is now, and has been, many people. But at one point, the Asian American Writers' Workshop was simply myself, Jennifer Pan, and Solma Sharif. <laughs> Solmaz and I would talk about the relation between poetry and politics. We talked about Guantanamo and incarceration in Iran, whether Iranians and Arabs were Asian American. 
She told me to read June Jordan and Nazik, Za, Nazim Hikmet, and I gave her wrong advice about her writing. <laughs> she coined the name of our literary festival, Page Turner, and the sign by the kitchen sink possesses her as its author. The day that my book came out many years ago, Solmaz saw me reading it at work, and she sent me a one-line email telling me to stop bopping my head to my own tune like Kanye. <laughs> Instead, she convinced me to ditch work. I wish I could do the same now to celebrate Solmaz's own book, Look. But I am in California, and so this short introduction. If many poets have claimed their task to the purification of language, including right-wing poets like Eliot and Stein, Solmaz Sharif seeks to heal our debased language from a force of which these poets were symptoms. In her debut poetry collection, Look, Solmaz reappropriates the language of the internal dictionary of the Department of, the Def of Defense. If even basic words like look are denatured to refer to military cir circuitry, the book asks the reader to look at the atrocities committed in the name of the war on terror. For Western colonialism, language is not an aesthetic object that sits outside of time, but a tool of indexing an imperial bureaucracy. The 1.5 million dead in Iraq and Afghanistan are replaced with euphemisms like, quote, collateral damage, unquote, biometric data, and statistics like the one I have just deployed. This is not disinterested jargon, but reflects an ideology that says that Muslim life is cheap and a drone war that simply kills any adult-aged males who happen to be in a certain place at a certain time is okay. While many of the poems are acts of empathy, like the poems to Salim Hamdan, which we just heard from Kathy, imprisoned in Guantanamo, these are not poems by a liberal poet who seeks to, quote, humanize the enemy, but rather poems that start with the idea that vocabulary is an object, one both sculptural and manipulated by powerful hands. As Solmaz writes, quote, the political is not topical or thematic. It is tactical and formal. It is not, as its strictest definition supposes, something relegated to legislative halls, but something enacted wherever power is at hand, power being at hand wherever there is a relation, including the relation between text and reader, unquote. The dominant affects are different than, than humanization or agitprop. There is sometimes an intimate lyrical voice that tells secrets, other times a more plastic official one. As the book's tone shifts between sensuousness and flat objectivity and political conscience, Solmaz layers together strata of death, of fury and eros and elegy. Please join me in welcoming Solmaz Sharif to the stage. I'm going to enjoy this for a second. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the first event I did here at the Asian American Writers Workshop was a reading with Patrick Russell, um, whose work I love. And he began it by saying that his writing career has just been a series of generosities. And I thought, that's so true. And I also thought, I'm going to say that when I come back to the Asian American Writers Workshop and get to read from my book. Um, and I'm so honored to be here. 
and to be able to actually thank the generosities that I've experienced in person and to be back home. I think I'd like to start by reading a new poem, if that's okay, or a newer one that's not in the book. And it's called Social Skills Training. Studies suggest, how may I help you, officer, is the single most disarming thing to say and not, what's the problem? Studies suggest it's best the help reply, my pleasure, and not, no problem. Studies suggest it's best not to mention problem in front of power, even to say there is none. Gloria Steinem says women lose power as they age, and yet the loudest voice in my head is my mother. <laughs> Studies show the mother we have in there isn't the mother that exists. Mine says, what the fuck are you crying for? <laughs> Studies show the baby monkey will pick the fake monkey with fake fur over the furless wire monkey with milk without contest. Studies show to negate a thing makes us think it anyway. I'm not sad. I'm not sad. Studies recommend regular expressions of gratitude and internal check-ins. Studies define assertiveness as deference cut with self-respect. Enough, the wire mother says. History is a kind of study. History says we forgave the executioner. Before we mopped the blood, we asked, Lord, judge, have I executed well? Studies suggest yes. What the fuck are you crying for, officer? The wire mother teaches me to say. <laughs> While America suggests, Solmaz, have you thanked your executioner today? It's especially satisfying to hear Ken said that he, he gave me bad advice on my book, <laughs> I have to say, because I have a very distinct memory of that moment. Uh, he graciously agreed to read the manuscript, an early iteration of it, um, and we were incredibly busy. We were actually planning the Page Turner Festival, and there was a deadline the next day for the Walt Whitman Prize or, or something, and um, he finally came back with comments, and he was like, well, maybe you shouldn't use redaction, and maybe you shouldn't put the DOD terms in small caps. Like, they shouldn't, we shouldn't know that they're in there, basically. And I was like, that's the whole book, Ken. Like, <laughs> and then he says, I hope that's helpful. It's like, it's <laughs> maybe even two weeks ago, but not tonight. Um, but, but anyway, there are terms throughout this book uh, from the U.S. Department of Defense's dictionary. The title itself, Look, is a term from the U.S. Department of Defense's dictionary which the DOD has translated or redefined to mean um, in mine warfare, the period in which a mine circuit is receptive of an influence, which just gives a sense of the kind of syntactical uh, and linguistic acrobatics of state-sponsored violence and state-sponsored language. That word influence is especially haunting to me. I'm pretty sure that's the child that steps on the mine um, and sets it off. Um, We've heard a lot, so I, I, I think maybe I'll just read two from in here. Desired appreciation. Until now, now that I've reached my 30s, all my muse's poetry has been harmless, American and diplomatic. A learned helplessness is what psychologists call it, my docile desired state. I've been largely well-behaved and gracious. I've learned the doctors learned of learned helplessness by shocking dogs. Eventually, we things give up. Am I grateful to be here? Someone eventually asks if I love this country. In between the helplessness, the agents, the nation must administer a bit of hope, must meet basic dietary needs, ensure by tube, by nose, by throat, by other orifice, must fist bump a janitor, must muss up some kid's hair and let him loose around the Oval Office, click, click, could be cameras or the teeth of handcuffs closing to fix the arms overhead. There must be a doctor on hand to ensure the shoulders do not dislocate, and there must be Prince's raspberry beret. <laughs> click, click, could be Morse code tapped out against a coffin wall to the neighboring coffin. Outside my window, the snow lights cobalt for a bit at dusk, and I'm surprised every second of it. I had never seen the country like this. Somehow, I can't say yes. This is a beautiful country. 
I have not cast my eyes over it before. That is, in this direction, is how John Brown put it when he looked out from the scaffold. I feel like I must muzzle myself, I told my psychiatrist. So you feel dangerous, she said. Yes. So you feel like a threat? Yes. Why was I so surprised to hear it? Drone. Begins with an epigraph by Frank Bedart, his poem written in the voice of Nijinsky. Let this be the body through which the war has passed. Somewhere I did not learn mow down or mop up. Somewhere I wouldn't hear, your father must come with me or, I must fingerprint your grandmother, can you translate please? The FBI has my cousin's computers. My father says, say whatever you want over the phone. My father says, don't let them scare you, that's what they want. My mother has a hard time believing anything's bugged. My father and I always talk like the world listens. My father is still on the bus with contraband papers under his seat as uniforms storm down the aisle. It was my job to put a cross on each home with dead for clearing. It was my job to dig graves into the soccer field. I wrote red tracksuit. I wrote Shahida, headless, found beside sad mosque. I wrote their epitaphs in chalk. From my son's wedding mattress, I know this mounds his room. I dropped a knee and engaged the enemy. I emptied my clip, then finished the job. I took two steps in and threw a grenade. I took no more than two steps into a room before firing. In Haditha, we cleared homes, we cleared, we cleared homes Fallujah style. My father was reading the Quran when they shot him through the chest. They fired into the closet, the kitchen, the 90-year-old, the stove. Just where was I? Una a una tu cara en todos los buses urbanos. Here lie the mortal remains of one who in life searched your face. Call me when you get home. Let's miss an appointment together. Let's miss another flight to repeated strip searches, that Haditha bed with magenta queen sheets and wood-shelved headboard and blood splattered up the walls to the ceiling. They held each other. They slept on opposing ends, wishing one would leave. Mother doesn't know who I am anymore. I write, Mustafa Muhammad Khalaf, 15 months old. I write, here lies an unknown martyr, a big security guard with a blue shirt found near an industrial area with a, cane of, a chain of keys. Martyr unknown, only bones. They ask if I have anything to declare, then limit my response to fruits and nuts. An American interrupts an A and B conversation to tell me, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. He strikes me as a misstep away from, she was asking for it. What did you expect after fishing Popov from a trash bin? What did you expect after accepting a marbled palace? They drag the man who killed my uncle out a hole. They inspect him for ticks on national television. No one in my family celebrates. When the FBI knocks, I tell them, I don't have to do anything I don't want to do, and they get a kick out of that. She just laid there and took it like a champ. She was dying for it. At a protest, a man sells a shirt that reads, my dick would pull out of Iraq. My mother tape records my laugh to mail bubble wrapped back home. My mother records me singing, Yeshab Mahtab, Mahmia Tukhab. I am singing the moon will come one night and take me away side street by side street, sitting on a pilled suburban carpet or picking blue felt off the hand-me-down couch, the displaced whatnots. I practice the work of worms, how much I can wear away with no one watching. Two generations ago, my blood moved through borders according to grazing and seasons. Then a lifeline of planes. Planes fly so close to my head, filled with bomblets and disappeared men. Scaffolding sprouts nooses, sagging with my dead. I burn my finger on the broiler and smell trenches, my uncle pissing himself. Shopping bags are legs, there is half a head in the gutter. I say, hello, NSA, when I place a call. Somewhere a file details my sexual habits. Some tribunal may read it all back to me. Kolesorhi, I know the cell they will put me in. They put me onto a crooked pile of others to rot. Is this what happens to a brain born into war? A city of broken teeth, the thuds of falling? We have learned to sing a child calm in a bomb shelter. I am singing to her still. Thank you so much.
transition into um, some Q&A. We really want to keep this informal and get as many audience questions in here as possible. So as I started off, um, I just want to encourage everyone to start thinking of things that they might want to ask Salmaz, um, Kathy, Ricky, and Mariam. Um, um, I think uh, the readings were just incredible and so moving, and I think we've, um, I'm really, there's a lot that my body is processing now too, so I think um, maybe sit with it and, and, um, and think of things that you might want to ask. Um, you know, there's, um, there's a way uh, in which in writing political poetry that uses source materials, um, there must be so many um, moments as you're interacting with these materials that you have uh, also just revelations or emotional reactions and, and all sorts of, you know, I, I kind of wanted to first hear from, from all of you a little bit about um, where do you go from that primary document, from that event, from that archive? Um, what, you know, what happens? And how, how does working with that kind of source um, push the sort of boundaries of your practice or of language? Okay, um, it's hard to say where I go or why certain things jump out at me and feel like they have to be in a poem and no other, no other place. Um, I think that more and more I am becoming convinced that poetry is not a, so a form of writing but a form of reading and a form of thinking and being in the world. So I um, like the grocery list that could be a poem, for example. I approach the texts themselves and the source materials as if I were reading a poem. And what does that mean? That means that I am looking for something that somehow collapses the distance between myself and what is being discussed, that collapses time, that makes it contemporary and therefore timeless, right? And also something that has, that's driven actually by a gaze of love and grief, um, which is an antidote to the kind of clinical necessity of, of the materials, at least that I'm dealing with, or even if you're looking at human rights documents, right, is that they need that kind of really clinical, factual gaze um, and language to them. But even that can be looked at through the eyes of a poem um, and treated as such. I absolutely agree. I think that, that's so smart. Smaz is so smart. Um, yeah, it makes sense that poems or poetry is a act of substantiating or making. I mean, literally, it means to make. So, I agree. Poem anything can be a poem as long as you sort of, for me, argue the point, make the point. Um, but to your question, um, it reminds me of a conversation I was having today with uh, one of my great friends, Roger Reeves. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. I'm glad it's not recorded. But, um, it is. oh, God. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, yeah, yes. today we were talking about um, when we got to the subject of our own sort of poetics. And um, I started talking about the first poem in my book, which is a poem called Conditions for Southern Gothic. And I'm not sure anyone would know this but me, and Roger didn't even know this, but the source material behind that poem. Um, it, it refers to, rather, a, the 1811 German Coast Uprising in Louisiana, which I'm not sure many people know about. It's, it's considered the largest um, slave rebellion in, in North America, but it probably doesn't really get the um, attention it deserves, if that's the verb, because they only killed two white people in the, in the process. Um, and it was also sort of um, ended, you know, they were, so the German coast, there's a large German population in Louisiana, surprise. And there's like, they were sort of marching down to New Orleans to 
do what they should have been doing, you know, rebelling and all that. And uh, they stopped. They were, they were uh, ended sort of on the path. And what happened was is that the leaders of that revolt were killed and their heads were cut off and they were put on stakes on the levee to, you know, be a scare tactic. So in the poem, it, it literally starts off, therefore my head was kingless, and there's this headless black boy I see just sort of speaking in the swamp. Um, but that literally came to me as a dream. So it's just a way that already my body is processing this with, you know, with my consent or not, I don't know. So, and it was really important for me to speak to that way that it came to me as dream, because that to me speaks to how we, um, sort of swallow history or we are always already born with that history and it sort of just has to sort of have uprisings within you. So that poem, it wasn't really, outside of what I'm saying right now, it wasn't that um, central for me to name the, the source text. It's not like in notes or anything in that particular instance, but I wanted it to seem sort of like it came from, it came it as a dream and it was, it was shocking to me. And so. I wanted that to be a, another sort of source material as well, the dream itself. Hello. I think you guys already said really eloquent things about um, source material, but the question of um, how do you use source material in your poetry or primary sources, um, so as you mentioned time, and I think that is very es essential in, in, terms for, in terms of my relationship with source material. Like, um, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, because it takes time for me to metabolize the source material and so that it it feels like it's actually coming from me so that it's become so that it's like a somatic uh, experience you know um, as an example um, I'm actually not really I'm not working on poetry right now I'm working on essays and for a long time I had this uh, some of you already know that I had this obsession with Richard Pryor and so what I did was I kind of transcribed all of his audio and his live performances. And, um, and I wanted to see if I could turn it, them, uh, Richard Pryor's words into a poem, of course, I couldn't, <laughs> you know? It felt like I was, you know, I mean, there were also questions of appropriation, but it took a long time for me to kind of um, develop a relationship with Richard Pryor, which with the source material that is Richard Pryor. And it's important to have that because I think that when we're working with source material, we sometimes find it really awkward because it's like when we first use it, it sort of sits woodenly on the page, you know, and it's like really important to kind of really kind of sit with it and develop a relationship with it like anything else, which I think you do uh, brilliantly. You know, it feels the, the, uh, military dictionary terms are very much strict. I, I love what Ken was saying about how it's not, this is, it doesn't make any attempt to humanize, but, and it's very much, uh, the terms are very extrinsic to the body, yet at the same time, we really kind of feel it too. So, anyway. Yeah, I mean, you all have said almost everything there is to say about this already. Um, I'll just say that I think the process with Index of the Disappeared in particular is slightly different because it is an archive, so we're constantly collecting like the entire documents. Like we actually have the entire Department of Defense dictionary in the archive. Um, and you know, and we collect each edition of it as it comes out and update, you know, the, the previous edition that we had in the archive. Um, and then what we're doing is we collect uh, text fragments. So like the list of text fragments I read to you guys are, are a selection of a really larger kind of library of text fragments that we actually distribute as postcards when we um, circulate the archive um, so that people can take something out of the archive because it's a, a non-circulating library. People can't borrow things from it. So we like to have something that people can take away. Um, and the text fragments really are, like you said, they're the things that jump out you know, when you're reading through these documents. And to me, they're always the things that jump out because they're the things that don't belong. Um, they're the, these moments where, um, as I said before, there's official language that just ruptures into the unofficial register. And they're the moments where a really inhumane and inhuman, in many ways, system uh, suddenly reveals the human actors within that system. Um, and uh, those are really interesting moments to me. Like, 
uh, where you just have, you'll be reading like the CIA Inspector General report um, from 2004, all about you know this internal CIA investigation of um, the rendition program, uh, and uh, you know suddenly there'll be this moment where they're discussing the death of Gul Rahman in the salt pit, and the officer who was responsible for it, it this this man died because of exposure to cold, and the officer who was r responsible is responding to the questions about it by saying, "But you know how cold is cold really?" And you're just like, "What? <laughs> Wait, what?" <laughs> Like, that's really interesting. <laughs> like, that's always stuck with me, and I think mm -hmm. everyone who's read that report remembers that line, because it's just so weird, you know? And it just really stays with you. And there's, there's so many moments like that in these documents. Um, and I think they're really, you know, it's like how everyone remembers Rumsfeld's known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Um, and it's become, a kind of phrase that has taken on meaning in so many different spheres that he totally did not intend. Right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think we're actually going to um, take some questions from the audience. Want to let out? Yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you all for coming here and for reading such wonderful poetry for all of us. Um, it was really powerful and really meaningful. Um, I was wondering. How do you continually engage with poetry that may have been painful to write? And I was just wondering how you do that. Yeah. I'll just repeat the question for the <laughs> folks in the back. Um, to how do you uh, engage with, with poetry that's painful to write? Not in a healthy way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't figured that out. It's funny, I was just speaking with a friend of mine, Glennar, who's a fantastic visual artist about this and I don't know I uh, I let it whelm me and that's not sustainable so um, and it's funny because I've been asked by students also and I want to give them an answer that I want I want to figure out a model that would be somehow sustainable uh, I'm not sure that I have or I will I just it consumes me completely and then months later, I kind of come out for a little bit of air, and then I go under again when I'm in this material. It's probably true that it's not sustainable to be a poet, I mean, honestly. <laughs> like, we laugh, but actually, like, <laughs> real life. Or to be an artist, more generally. Um, I, I don't know either. <laughs> okay. See, something hates me, but um, <laughs> I don't know. There, I, Sleep helps, but um, there's this moment where something that you wrote, you read it the other day, and you could read it, and this this one day for some reason that phrase, the light hits you in a certain face, and then you're bawling on stage, and it's just that's that wound that opens up, and I think that's just sort of the is contract the word, or that's sort of the thing that we do. I mean, we sort of it's terrible because it may not be sustainable, but that's sort of the thing that we are engaged in, or at least one of the things. So um, how? I don't know how, but it is it, it, it is a thing that happens. So, um, But one thing that's useful is just the fact that I did, did write it. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way, but sort of the idea of like, oh, I wrote it. I had this notion that I contained or sort of understood the sentiment or, or, or event well enough to have written it. And that's sort of triumphant. Of course, once you get to the end, you realize, but I'm alone again. Um, <laughs> but you do, you're right, it's like, and if you're Louise Gluck, you know, will I ever write the next poem? I don't know, but um, yeah, I'll stop. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I always, um, I mean, I'm primarily a, an, an artist working in other media, and then I, I, I write mostly essays, and then this is stuff I write primarily for myself um, as a way of like note taking. Um, but I, I, I've always written to make sense of the world. Um, it's always been the way that I like write my way through things. Um, and I think um, for me, uh, I, I feel like it actually would be harder to experience all of these things without like without making work about them. I think making work about them helps to organize the experience of them. Um, 
but at the same time, it does distill them down so much that when you then revisit the work, it's like experiencing it intensified, you know, tenfold. Because you go back to that moment of making the work and how intensely you had to feel the, yeah. the thing in order to make the work. And so the moment of revisiting the work is always very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I, one of my professors, uh, Ivan Bolin, was recently saying um, that poetry is necessarily traumatic because it's about making the thing alive again inside you. Yeah, exactly, for, for life. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I think I'm the wrong, I don't know. Therapy helps. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's different for every person. I think, like, with some, for some poets, they, could, they just, like, they just, you know, I think they, 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 they tackle it. They're able to just go there, you know. Um, I don't know who, but I, I know they're out there. But uh, for me personally, it's, uh, it's like a system of deferrals and failures and revision. Um, but then, um, you know, it's so, and it's, a, it's mostly, I would say it's like 90% deferring and then like 10% finally like kind of orbiting around it and finally kind of go, going there. So, um, whereas I think for other poets, they're kind of able to zero in. But I think that kind of act of kind of coming back to it again and again and again is, um, is able to, you're able to look at it in a more clear-eyed way. And that's how I guess the pain comes, becomes alive again and again and again. <laughs> Can we take another question from the audience? So thank you guys so much for coming and just like being amazing people, basically, and being amazing writers. And all the poems read tonight made me want to cry. So that's good. That's a good thing. Um, I just wanted to ask, because, um, Jamak, your poem, one of the lines was um, before the age of 30. The age, before the age of 30, you yeah. hadn't, essentially, you hadn't politicized yet. I was, I was wondering when everyone here decided to start politicizing their work so the question was was when you started to sort of pol think politically about your work so that line's a total lie <laughs> <laughs> and what it is is uh ovid has a poem um called ibis i believe is how you pronounce it i don't know if anybody's read it but it's a really long gratuitous curse poem um, and it's really elaborate and kind of like boyishly gruesome, you know, and he wrote it when he was in exile. And it's interesting because his exile poems, there's a lot of pleading in them. They're almost embarrassing to read. They're, you know, they make me cringe and they're really heartbreaking. And then somehow he gets to the other side of that and he's like, fuck all y'all, you know? Um, and I want it, and the first line is like, until now, now that I've reached my, I think it was 40s or 50, I can't remember what the decade was, all my muses poetry has been harmless. That was his opening line, so I took it. Um, because, uh, I mean, I guess it, at all times, in all ways, I am attempting a kind of diplomacy anyway. Or, or trying to figure out the language that would make it impossible to not be heard. And that language requires a very specific affect um, and a very specific social conditioning, kind of. Um, so it is and is not a lie, I think. But I would say that I was politicized like at birth, just because of who my parents, who my parents were, and my own kind of political tra trajectory. I mean, I had I had basically the same experience from growing up with parents in exile. Like everything's political, like all family life is basically suffused with politics at all times. So, yeah. The only thing I would add, I totally agree. I think, um, I think all language already is political from the get go. Um, but it's about, for me, recognizing sort of the awareness of being like sort of intentionally aware or, because 
Now, I remember in fourth grade where I was called both a white boy and a faggot both insults for reading a book. Um, and so that's a political moment, it seems to me, years later. And so, but I didn't know it at the time. I just knew I'm lonely and I, my feelings are hurt. But later I realized, oh, wait, just the act of sort of, again and again, the act of a black person reading a book has, you know, that people are trying to stop that or police that. Um, and not white people. These were my peers doing this, you know. So um, I don't know where I'm going. But the, 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 rec the recognition of it, I don't know, that happened. Um, I don't know when exactly. I'm 27, so I guess it happened before 30. But um, <laughs> that was that's an important moment for me to recognize it. Um. Um, I just want to say, I mean, I think I kind of talk about this in the essay. I mean, for a long time, I didn't think I had permission to write poetry. It, because Just because, you know, I uh, if, for a while, I didn't speak English. Um, and it didn't, like, so to write it, uh, poetry didn't really sit well. It just didn't, it was just not in my future, I thought. And I think I was really lucky because um, right when I started, I mean, when I start, started writing poetry, I felt like it was, I was, imi I always felt like I was imitating someone, you know, so I started writing uh, what I, you know, a white person's idea of a poem. And then, um, you know, like a sonnet about flowers. <laughs> You know, and then and then they were like, and then some teacher was like, you should write about your experience, <laughs> and so then I was writing a white person. I was writing a white person's idea of Asian poetry, <laughs> and um, so yeah, this is American poetry. And but it always, you know, I felt like I was like a charlatan. It didn't feel right, you know, just like I felt like I was wearing an ill-fitting suit. And um, and then I was very lucky, I think, because um, I had this uh, brilliant teacher, and I think a lot of some of us who um, stumble onto poetry, uh, a chance upon having uh, a teacher who's like, who actually it could be actually bad luck. And they're like, oh great, now I'm into writing poetry. But um, Myung Mi Kim, and she was the one who um, really. Uh, brought my awareness to, uh, you know, what, what that language is not a neutral medium and that, um, and, um, that to write in the English language is already politicized. And um, so that happened early on. So I would say the politicization, not just in terms of the content, but in terms of the actual form, um, in terms of the actual, uh, the actual material, the language, um, that was something that I became aware of, um, you know, when I started writing poetry, so. So the question is the sort of reconciling the two very different types of language from the source material, the Department of Events mm -hmm. manual one. Um, I think part of it is maybe not reconciling them or allowing them to interrupt each other and to, uh, to constantly butt up against each other. Part of the argument that Ken, for example, had for taking the small caps out was that they're distracting, right? Well, yeah. You know, <laughs> as in, yeah, let's be distracted for a moment, right? And let's actually look at what an ordinary poem, what is just beneath a, a so-called ordinary poem, and what happens if we add this other veil on top of it, just to kind of reveal, a veil to actually reveal the violence that's happening beneath every ordinary poem, every ekphrastic poem to a Flemish painting, you know? Um, so that's one of it, well, that's one part of it, but I think, I also allowed it to evolve in my case, and I wanted at first for the, the poems to be 
literal definitions. And they would be like poetic definitions of the words that somehow reveal the truth of the, of the terms. And it was very one-to-one. -one. And what happened was that then the language of warfare remained in the actual act of warfare that we, common, that we commonly accept as warfare and that it remains something that happened to Iraq and Afghanistan specifically. So I was basically just trafficking in the same violence that I was supposedly trying to buck in a way. Um, so I thought that this should be something that just kind of infiltrates and disrupts and actually messes up every other pretty picture that I might want to paint with my words um, and with my life because I do think that that's what it, it means to live in the US right now. I mean, I think that that is the formal reality of living in the US is this split between the violence that we are constantly perpetuating, the violence that some of us have to constantly witness and those of us who don't have to necessarily witness those violences and where we seem to believe those borders are. Um, I just wanted a formal way to challenge that. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more. Oh, if anyone else has one more question. Okay, I'll start. It's a very <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about uh, my own work, but I could say a little bit about look. Look, um, you know, I think when the aestheticization of politics happens, when I see it in writing, it happens when uh, we've been talking a lot about trauma, right? And um, I think it's when trauma becomes domesticated or when tra trauma becomes domesticated, individualized, or humanized in that sort of kind of American Horatio Alger sort of myth that we hear about. And then, um, um, and by, and by d uh, the domestication of trauma, it's sort of this kind of, um, you know, we make it into a singular experience that's divorced from sort of the structural uh, implications of what what's happening and um, I think when uh, you know when I was making a jo joke about write about your experience you know I mean that's usually what people crave or what sort of the American audience crave is it, it craves is this sort of it's it's a privatization of trauma basically um, and um, <laughs> And, uh, and sort of, and we're taught that in chem uh, creative writing classes too. And you know, it's like write about your experience, but in a very particular way, like in a hands removed so that it doesn't implicate the reader. Um, and I think uh, look, it <laughs> I think look is astonishing because it's one, one of the few examples of books that is where, um, where uh, Somas refuses to do that. She refused, and again, this is going back to what Ken, she refuses to humanize singularize a trauma and her, um, you know, and she keeps bringing it back to like this part in, um, where was it, Mess Hall, uh, uh, America, ignore the window and look at your lap, even your dinner napkins are on fire, which I think somehow this kind of m makes everyone complicit. Maybe, okay, maybe one, one last question. <laughs> no? Questions for each other? Or do we wanna? All right, I think I we should. Come talk to me. Yeah. yeah, well, we're gonna, we're, gonna, um, we're gonna end the program, but first I just wanted to congratulate you, Salmaz. And, um, <laughs> And I really, really want to thank Mariam, Mariam, Kathy, and Ricky. Thank you so much for, for being here with us um, this evening. The new 
hatred of Islam or that kind of terrorist comes very recently. Palestine is not Pakistan. <laughs> Iraq is not Iran, and Hamas is not Hezbollah. Iranians are not Arabs, Turks are Turks, Farsi is Persian, which is not Arabic. Shia is the same as Shiite, and Sunnis and Shia are not ethnic groups, like Kurds, who are both Sunni and Shia, or Shiite. I know it's confusing. Sorry about that.